Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Annie Fletcher, and I'm one of the organizers of this, uh, what's turning out to be a rather monstrous event, Becoming Dutch, a two-year project, which we began in January of this year, and of which this four-week caucus is part. So welcome, welcome again to many who constantly come back, and welcome to all our new visitors. It's wonderful to see many new faces, as well as the slightly tired uh, older ones here again. Um, we're really on the first day of the fourth and, would you believe, final public weekend of Eindhoven Caucus. It's kind of hard to believe that we're coming to the end of what's been an incredibly intense, but I think really inspiring series of weeks of working and thinking together. As many of you know, this caucus is a meeting organized by the Van Abbe Museum to openly and publicly research the issues arising from the two-year project Becoming Dutch. A caucus, as many of you know very well at this point, but we'll rehearse the idea just once more, finally. A caucus has several meanings which we're very interested in exploring and, and figuring out the potential of. It um, is known to be uh, understood as, a, maybe originally, that's a, a possibility, um, as a Native American term, um, which was used by the Native Americans a long time ago, um, as a way of thinking about the community, as a way of meeting and discussing and making decisions about that particular society's future, and in fact to vote on these decisions. So in effect an early articulation of the performance of democracy. Of course nowadays it's used in many other ways to suggest a kind of focus group or a meeting of party members within a legislative body to select leaders and determine strategy. Um, and we're interested also in those very pragmatic political uh, terms and the pragmatic political role a caucus might have. Because it seems important for us to put the onus on the museum to think through these ideas, to think the political today. And the onus on all of us as creative thinkers and artists to explore our sense of agency and power within contemporary society. And to actively think about what decisions we might make and how we might contribute as artists and creative thinking to our society now. So throughout this, this whole period, these, these months, we've, uh, this month, we've been very, very lucky, I think, to have uh, a group of 40 um, artists from Eindhoven, from all over the world, who've come to stay and think with us. They've literally occupied um, dormitories, rooms, various places throughout uh, Eindhoven city and come to, to our museum every day to work and to think with us. We see this group as very important, uh, both now in forming a kind of critical mass and even a memory of this thinking time, but also as a group of people who will work with us to, in a series of ways towards developing the exhibition and various other outcomes of this project, Becoming Dutch. And th this idea of becoming Dutch, we've often said it's true, we have a line in the sand, an exhibition, a moment of visibility. But we hope that this process actually changes us, that the challenges figured out openly and publicly in this kind of reflection with you, but also the, the exhibition, the works that are made, and, and the new positionalities that it might push us towards, might have a long-term effect on our museum. And that's a, a sincere hope we have, um, and maybe not so visible at this moment. So it's very interesting to kind of rethink the last four weeks and some of the thoughts and ideas that have been reflected. And many people have put us under interesting pressure um, in terms of what the role of the museum might be and whether it in fact ameliorates certain political questions or in fact can actively um, pr provide a sort of new thinking towards uh, new solutions or maybe even just new questions. We sort of realized that rushing to solutions may not be actually the most important thing at this moment. We started uh, in our first week, in fact, looking close to home, if one could use that term, trying to think through what is our situation right here, right now in the Netherlands. We opened with a series of sociologists and other active thinkers um, on our very first day who tried to think through what it might mean to understand uh, the processes of globalization or world integrated capitalism, as Roger Burgel called it, what it might mean to be in a time of increased migration. Um, and what it might mean to, to try and actively think of new ways of being together. 
Uh, Luke Hagendorn um, very quickly debunked a kind of um, a, a long-held myth in the Netherlands that we aren't very nationalist in our thinking, that there is no strong national identity. He gave us kind of quantitative and rather intriguing statistical analysis of how we might be seen to collectively form opinions here in the Netherlands. And that kind of thinking is very important for us, that we might really understand a localized, a located position before we invited many fantastic thinkers from throughout the world to, to kind of think with us. Another really important voice at that moment was uh, the writer Abdel Kader Ben Ali, who discussed the immigrant position and talked about the idea that they were expected to polish, we're all expected to polish our contradictions. So this kind of living with ambivalence or the complexity of our identity is not a, a sort of a suitable attitude to have. So many thoughts like this came into our mind over the last few weeks. The one that kind of rings in my ear the most at the moment was uh, that of Paul Gilroy last weekend, who really talked to us about the idea that culture might be in fact a safety valve for these important political decisions and we should be careful about that. We should not accept the deep politicalization of our political structures and our academies and our public institutions and we should be really attend against the idea that culture might be a safer space through which to play out these ideas. Rather culture needs to kind of recuperate the erasures and transmit in a very effective way the erasures that are happening um, in, a, in a sort of effort to kind of come to a cultural sameness. So with that in mind, I'd like to, I'm delighted to open a final weekend and to welcome Chantal Mouffe, who's come here and will stay all weekend. Um, and she will um, give a paper this morning called Agonistic Public Spaces and Democratic Politics. Thank you, Chantal. Open to use it to put my papers, I think. No? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, participate into this uh, caucus, um, and I'm really, uh, you know, glad to have been invited. Um, my contribution is going to be from the point of view of political theory. So it's going to be a very theoretical one. Uh, I'm not going to address you know, directly uh, the, the impact of those uh, um, discussion on um, artistic practices, but I, leave it, I will leave that to you. But I think that you know, there are quite important consequences uh, of this uh, discussion. Um, but that can be you know, appropriated in, in different ways. Uh, and, and as I say, this is not what I'm going to intend to do. I'm going to clarify the series of concepts. Particularly what I want to clarify is uh, what does one understand exactly by agonistic uh, uh, politics? Because there is a, um, a whole current of uh, thought. Uh, in fact, it has developed as a challenge to the dominant model in democracy, which is the deliberative model. And um, a lot of people are referred to as agonistic uh, theorists. Uh, but so I'm going to show there are, in fact, many differ important differences between them. And I think it's important to understand those differences because the way in which this agonistic view is going to have, uh, you know, relevance for democratic politics depends very much on what kind of agonism um, is at stake. So this is what I want to show. Basically, I'm going to argue that there is quite important differences between the view of agonism that I am, I've been putting forward and many other views. Uh, so you can, of course, after that, choose the type of agonism that uh, you prefer. But I think it's uh, sometimes I, I, I've been a bit uh, surprised to see that uh, my view, idea of agonism were appropriated in a way which did not at all correspond to what I understand by that. And it's because they were reading my agonism through the other theory of agonism. So this is what you know, I think is very important to be clear about the different form of agonism. There are, of course, many uh, um, family resemblance, to use a term uh, of Wittgenstein, among uh, agonistic uh, theories, but they are also very important uh, differences. And this is you know, the, the differences that I want to uh, um, clarify in this presentation. So what I'm going to do first is to present uh, what is my uh, view of agonism, and then you know, we will see the differences with uh, other agonistic theories. Um, so, 
First, I need to delineate the theoretical framework which inform my approach and its main tenets have been developed in several of my previous work. Here, I'm going to limit myself to the aspects which are relevant for uh, the argument that I want to present in uh, this context. So let me first uh, start by clarifying the distinction which I have uh, proposed to make between politics and the political. I mean, not, not that uh, uh, this distinction, you know, I'm, I'm the first one to put it, but as you will see, there are different ways in which the distinction can uh, be made. And of course, I do it in a particular uh, way. Uh, and I think that, you know, to understand what is uh, the difference between both is very central to understanding the specificity of my approach. Well, of course, in ordinary language, uh, it's not very common to speak about the political, and maybe you find it strange to have to say, well, politics and the political. Uh, but I think that this distinction is an important one because it opens important alley for reflection. And as I say, a variety of political theories are, are making them, and of course, among those theories, all the agonistic uh, um, theories. The difficulty, uh, though, is that, in fact, there is no agreement concerning the meaning that are attributed to the respective term. You know, so people make this distinction, but understand different things by uh, politics and by the political. So this, of course, creates a certain uh, confusion. But commonalities exist, however, and I think they can provide some point of orientation. For instance, to make this distinction, uh, between politics and the political suggests that there is a very important difference between two types of approach. On one side, there is political science, with the, which deal with the empirical field of politics, and then there is political theory, which is a domain of philosophers who inquire not about the facts of politics, but about the nature of the political. So if we wanted to express this distinction in a philosophical way, we could borrowing in this case the uh, vocabulary of Heidegger, say that politics refer to the ontic level, while the political is to do with the ontological level. Uh, of course, the, to clarify this distinction, the ontic is to do with the manifold uh, practices of conventional politics, while the ontological level concerns the very way in which society is symbolically instituted. So to acknowledge what, you know, uh, is this, uh, uh, again, using a vocabulary from Heidegger term, uh, ontological difference, that is very important philosophical consequences. In fact, it's characteristic of a uh, series of theoretical perspectives which are called post-foundationalist. And there will be a lot to say about that, but this is not the direction what, that I'm going to take. Because at this point, what I'm uh, interested in, in is in scrutinizing the different way in which the political is envisaged. And here we can roughly distinguish two main perspectives, which are going to be decisive for my argument later. Some theorists envisage the political as a space of freedom and public deliberation while others see it as a space of power, conflict, and antagonism. The first view, which is sometimes referred to as the associated view, uh, uh, is, you know, in fact, the, the, the one that I do not share, while the other uh, view is called the dissociative one, not for the view for which politics has got to do with conflict, antagonism. And my understanding of the political clearly belongs to this second uh, approach, the dissociative uh, view. More precisely, this is how I distinguish between politics and the political. By the political, I refer to the dimension of antagonism, which I take to be constitutive of human society, something that cannot be eradicated. And by politics, I refer to the set of practices, institutions, through which a certain order is created. An order which is attempt to organize human coexistence, but always in a context of conflictuality, which is provided by you know, this ontological dimension that of the political. Well, so it's clear that this dimension of antagonism is central to my approach. And as I'm going to argue, this is basically where there is a difference between my approach and other agonistic uh, uh, theories. And I'm going to begin by clarifying this uh, idea and, uh, of antagonism. 
What I want to bring to the fore is that political questions are not mere technical issues to be solved by experts. Of course, this is something that we are more and more uh, at all in the uh, area of uh, neoliberalism uh, and uh, um, you know, politics at the center, kind of third way politics. Political questions for me are questions which always involve decision, which require making a choice between conflicting alternatives. So it's not something that you know, can be solved by expert uh, on basis of rational calculus. Uh, and of course, this is something which cannot be grasped by the dominant tendency in liberal thought, which is characterized by a rationalist and an individualist approach. And this is why I think that this uh, uh, liberal thought era, I'm using liberal thought in, in very, very general uh, um, way in which, for instance, uh, somebody like uh, Habermas will definitely belong to uh, the liberal thought. Uh, and this approach is not able to envisage the pluralistic nature of the social world in an adequate way. That is, with the, all the conflict that this pluralism entails. Conflict for which no rational solution could ever exist. And this is, of course, where the dimension of antagonism lies, which I, I, I affirm characterize human societies. Because an antagonism is, in fact, a conflict which is no rational solution. And of course, you know, if you uh, uh, start from a rationalistic perspective, this is something that you cannot uh, acknowledge. Because the typical understanding of pluralism that we find in, in liberal theory is that we live in a world which, in which there is indeed many perspectives and values. Of course, they recognize uh, this pluralism, and they also recognize that due to empirical limitation, uh, for them they are empirical, for me, in fact, they are not at all empirical, they are ontological, we will never be able to adopt all those perspectives. No? There, the, there is not enough time, there are only, only 20 hours in the day, uh, 24, sorry, uh, and, a, <laughs> and a, a certain number of days in, 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 in the week and, 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 and weeks in, in the year. So, of course, we are limited empirically. Uh, we will never be able to you know, put ourselves in the shoes of everybody. But uh, if we were able to do that, uh, then we could really arrive to an harmonious and non-conflictual ensemble. Eh? So there is a plurality of view, but it's only because of empirical limitation that we cannot adopt them all. But in fact, when put together, they, they, they constitute an harmonious uh, ensemble. And of course, this is where the, the, the dimension of antagonism and the fact that there are some views which are incompatible with each other is necessarily, of course, uh, erased. Uh, and of course, this is why this perspective, which is dominant in liberal political theory, must negate antagonism in, uh, 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 in, in uh, central to the political. Indeed, one of the main tenets of this kind of liberalism is the rationalist belief in the availability of a universal consensus based on reason. You know, even if it's, uh, this consensus is uh, envisaged, as it is now envisaged by Habermas, as a regulative idea in the Kantian sense. No? Something that you know, we, we've got to tend towards it, but we will never reach it uh, because of empirical uh, uh, lim limitation. So, but this rational consensus is something which is available, uh, at least theoretically. No wonder, of course, that the political in its antagonistic dimension constitute the blind spot of such a view. Uh, indeed, by bringing to the fore the inescapable moment of decision. And here I use decision in the strong sense, in the sense, for instance, in which Jacques Derrida has insisted to decide is always to decide in an undecidable terrain. Uh, Derrida said that you know, if you make a decision that can be calculated rationally, it's not really a decision. A real decision is to decide in an undecidable terrain. And of course, this is what you know, uh, antagonism reveals, that uh, in some cases you've got to decide, but there is no uh, uh, rational point in which you say this is the rational decision. And this is what, you know, uh, why antagonism reveals the limit of any rational uh, consensus. And my argument is that it is only when we acknowledge the political in its antagonistic dimension that we can pose what I take to be the central question for democratic politics. And this is where you know, the relation between 
antagonisme démocratique politique is, is really, uh, uh, um, you know, bring to the fore. Uh, this question, Pache liberal theories, is not how to negotiate a compromise among competing interests. This is, for instance, the, the way in which the uh, aggregative view of democracy envisages democratic politics. Nor is it how to reach a rational, i.e. a fully comprehensive uh, uh, consensus, a consensus without exclusion, through deliberation. This is what you know, the other uh, model of democratic politics, the deliberative one, uh, propose. Um, because both of those views, in fact, eliminate the dimension of antagonism. Despite what many liberals want us to believe, the specificity of democratic politics is not the overcoming of the we-they opposition. Because, of course, when you assert the possibility of a rational consensus, it means that there is no more a we-them opposition. But, and and I, I think that here it's central to acknowledge that democratic politics cannot and should not attempt to uh, uh, overcome this we they uh, distinction because I'm going to show in a moment why it is you know, central to politics. But what is important is the way in which it is established because it can be established this we they in many different ways and some of them in fact are uh, conducive for democratic politics. Political identities are always collective identities. Uh, in politics we are therefore always dealing with the we, which is necessarily opposed to a they. And this is why, as I'm going to show in a moment, antagonism cannot be eliminated. Well, I know that this is some kind of thesis to which people are usually reacting very negatively. So, no, but why we say that we cannot overcome the, the we they? And I need here to explain how I reach such a, a conclusion theoretically. And I'm going to uh, do it using a notion uh, which is, uh, is being proposed by uh, American philosopher Henry Staten in a book which is called Wittgenstein and Derrida, where he tries to bring to the fore you know, the, 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 the point of commonality between uh, Wittgenstein and, and Derrida. And uh, Staten is proposed is the notion of what he called the constitutive outside. Uh, the constitutive outside aim at unveiling what is at stake in the constitution of identity. Uh, and by that, uh, uh, Staten wants to refer to a series of themes which are present in the work of Jacques Derrida. For instance, uh, supplement, traits, difference, and to show what, you know, what is at stake in, in, uh, in those notions. I want to insist here that this is not a notion that you are going to find ever in Derrida. No, it is a notion that uh, Staten has constructed on the basis of his reflection about the work of Derrida. And so the general aim of uh, uh, this uh, notion of constitutive outside is to highlight the fact that the creation of an identity always implies the establishment of a difference. Of course, in the philosophy of Derrida, this is done at a very abstract level. In fact, Derrida doesn't even speak of identity, he speaks of every form of objectivity. And, and, and uh, uh, of course, it, it's, uh, if, if you understand identity as you know, personal identity, of course, objectivity is something much more, uh, much more abstract. And this is the way, the level in which uh, uh, Derrida uh, uh, elaborate, uh, elaborate his view. But of course, we can also understand that in terms of personal identities, and what I'm interested to, to, to do is to bring the consequences of uh, the, such a reflection in the field of politics, and to show its relevance for the constitution of political identities. Uh, and as I said uh, uh, before, for me, co political identities are always collective identities. This is why they, you know, we are in terms of we, uh, they. Um, I argue that once we have understood that every identity is relational, right? that's, that's what the constitutive outside shows, and that the affirmation of a difference is a precondition for the existence of any identity, that is the perception of something other which constitutes its exterior, then 
we can understand why politics, which always deal with collective identities, is about the constitution of uh, we, and that this requires its, its very condition of possibility, the demarcation of a day. That is, in order to construct a we, which is what you know, politics is about, you need to demarcate the we from the day. You need to establish a constitutive outside to this uh, we. Of course, this does not mean that such a relation of we day is necessarily one of friend and enemy. That is, that it is an antagonistic uh, relation. Uh, but my point is that we should realize that there is always the possibility that in certain condition, this we-day relation could become antagonistic. There are many we-day relations which are simply relations of, 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 of difference. But you know, in certain conditions, there is always the possibility that this become antagonistic. And that happens when the day is perceived, and that can be a, a, a even purely phantasmatic, it does not really be the case, but when the day is perceived as putting into question the identity of the we, as threatening the existence of the we. When, when, when you know, a group began to see that another group uh, and, and, and as I said, it can even not be really the case. It could be simply phantasmatic. It's threatening its existence. Then this we day relation become antagonistic. No, if we accept that all form of political identities entail a we day distinction, this means that the possibility of emergence of antagonism can never be eliminated. No, we will always have, uh, uh, we never have a completely inclusive we. We always have we day. So there's always, of course, we cannot exactly predict. I mean, we can obviously uh, 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 um, envisage the consequences which are more likely to uh, uh, lead to this uh, antagonistic you know, dimension. But what is certain is that we can never uh, 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 believe in the advent of a society from which antagonism would have been eradicated. Antagonism is an ever-present possibility. And when we envisage the task of democratic politics, this is something that needs to be taken into account. Well, this is for one dimension of my approach, the concept of antagonism. Next to antagonism, there is another concept which is central to my approach, and is the concept of hegemony which I also take to be absolutely necessary in order to address the question of the political. To acknowledge the dimension of the political as the ever-present possibility of antagonism, which is the point I've just made, means coming to terms with the lack of a final ground and the indecidability which pervades every order. This signifies recognizing the fact that every society is the product of a series of practices attempting at establishing order, but always in a context of contingency. Or if I was to put this same sentence in my vocabulary, I would say that it signifies recognizing what I call the hegemonic nature of every kind of social order. The political is linked to those acts of hegemonic institution. It is in this sense that one has to differentiate the social from the political. The social is the realm of sedimented hegemonic practices. That is practices that conceal the originary act of their contingent political institution. Practice which are taken for granted. You know, things that, okay, that's the natural order. For instance, uh, uh, to give you an example, today we are told that uh, neoliberal globalization is, is, is there's no alternative. This is the nature of things, given the, so, but of course, neoliberal uh, uh, globalization is a, a, a form of hegemony. Uh, um, but at some point, you know, this hegemony becomes so accepted that people can't even imagine that, they, they, that uh, there is an alternative. They believe that it corresponds to the normal order of development of technology or, of, or whatever. While it is always the result of a certain uh, type of hegemonic politics, which have you know, 
been uh, 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 established a certain type of power relation, and there are always alternative. But, so when things become so sedimented, they appear as being natural and taking for granted. And this is you know, what I, I, I call the level of the uh, social. Uh, that is practice which conceal the originary act of their contingent political institution, which appear as taken for granted and as if they were self-grounded. But, of course, this is not the case. Things could always be otherwise. Uh, every order is the temporary uh, precarious articulation of contingent practices. That is, every order is predicated on the exclusion of other possibilities. No? Neoliberal globalization uh, uh, is predicated on the exclusion of other form of globalization. So this is uh, why it's important to acknowledge that every order is the expression of a particular structure of power relation. And it is in that sense that it can be called a political order. What is at a given moment considered as the natural order, jointly with the common sense, here I use the common sense in the, the, the Gramscian sense, which accompanies it, is always the result of sedimented hegemonic practices. And it's never the manifestation of a deeper objectivity, an objectivity that will be exterior to the practices that bring it into being. So according to the perspective that uh, uh, I uh, uh, am putting forward, society is not to be seen as the um, result of an unfolding logic that will be exterior to itself. Whatever the sources of this logic could be, and here, according to the different theoretical approach, you know, we have got uh, some, in the, some cases, the Marxist cases, for instance, the forces of production, you know, is the logic that determines the evolution of society. In the case of Hegel, it's the development of the spirit, in for order, it will be law of history, but in all those cases, in fact, there is a logic which is exterior to society and which, you know, determines the development of society. While here, I'm arguing that, in fact, uh, uh, it's not the case. There is society is never the uh, result of a logic exterior. It's always the result of a struggle within society between hegemonic uh, forces. So they are always alternative. Uh, I think that's very important to acknowledge that when we want to envisage, you know, the kind of uh, 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 political action that can be uh, done uh, today. As far as collective identities are concerned, we find ourselves in a similar situation. Identities are result of processes of identification. No, here, of course, is, is the, the I follow an anti-essentialist approach to identities. Identities are not there, you know, already given. They are always constructed and process uh, and result of processes of identification. So it also means that they are never completely fixed. That is, we are never confronted with we they opposition that will express essentialist identities, you know, identities that will pre-exist the process of identification. Moreover, since as I have stressed, the they represent the condition of possibility of the we, what you know we've called is constitutive outside, this means that the constitution of a specific we always depend on the type of they from which it is going to be differentiated. And this is really a crucial point, because it allows us to envisage the possibility of different type of we-they relation according to the way the they is constructed. And this is why, uh, as I said before, you know, some form of we-they opposition are very negative for democratic politics, while other form of we-they opposition will be conducive to the radicalization of, uh, of democracy. So it, it's really a central uh, question when we are envisaging democratic uh, politics. So <clears throat> the question now to ask is what kind of we-they is best for democratic politics? Um, because once we accept the ever present possibility of antagonism. We can understand that one of the main tasks of democratic politics consists in trying to diffuse the antagonistic potential which exists in social relation. Because obviously, uh, uh, democracy cannot uh, uh, exist with uh, we day opposition constructed on the basis of friend and enemy. So how can we you know, create institutions that are going to 
impede or at least make it less likely that this will happen. Well, if we accept that this cannot be done by transcending the we-they relation, I argue that it's, it's impossible because then we will not have more collective identities, but only by constructing it in a different way, then the following question arises. What could contribute, let's say, tame or a sublimated relation of antagonism? What form of we-they will it imply? To put it in a different way, how could conflict be accepted as legitimate, but also take a form which will not destroy the political association, no, which will not be constructed in, in antagonistic terms? And I think that this requires that some kind of common bond exists between the parties in conflict, so that they will not treat their opponents as enemies to be eradicated, they are not going to see the, the demands of their opponents as illegitimate, because this is precisely, of course, what happened in the antagonistic friend and enemy relation. So this is a solution which, of course, we can't uh, 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 follow. However, the opponent cannot be seen simply as competitors whose interests can be dealt with through mere negotiation or reconcile through deliberation, because that, of course, is the liberal solution. Because in this case, the antagonistic element simply is being eliminated. So if we want to acknowledge on one side the permanence of an, the antagonistic dimension of conflict, while on the other side allowing for the possibility of this conflict to be played out, so to speak, in a way which is compatible with democratic politics, we need to envisage a third type of relation. And this is precisely the type of relation which I have proposed to call agonism. So while antagonism is a we-they relation in which the two sides are you know, enemies, they don't share any common ground. Agonism is a we-they relation where the conflicting parties although acknowledging that there is no rational solution to their conflict. Right? So it's not a question of sitting on and, and trying to find a rational solution. There is no rational solution. But they nevertheless recognize the legitimacy of their opponent. Now they say that, well, the, the demands of their opponent are legitimate. So this is why I said they are adversaries, not enemies. So an antagonistic relation is a relation between enemies, an agonistic relation is a relation between adversaries. What's the difference? Well, it means that in the case of adversaries, while they are indeed in conflict and in a conflict which is no rational solution, they see themselves as belonging to the same political association. They share a common symbolic space, and it is within this symbolic space that the conflict is going to take place. And of course, this, uh, uh, what, ex what exists among the adversaries is what I've called a conflictual consensus. The same element of consensus in the sense that they share a common symbolic space, they agree that on the ethical political principle that should uh, inform the association, but they disagree about their interpretation. And of course, and this is, those are disagreements you know, which cannot be uh, solved rationally. No, this is what the difference well, between adversaries and enemies. Well, here I think it's important to stress the difference between my understanding of adversary and the way in which this notion is usually found in liberal discourse. Because, of course, you know, term adversary is a term that you, you, you will find very commonly in liberal discourse. But I think that, in fact, when uh, uh, liberals refer to adversaries, what they really mean are competitors. Uh, what is at stake in the agonistic struggle, as I understand it, is in fact the very configuration of power relation around which a given society is structured. It is a struggle between opposing hegemonic project which can never be reconciled rationally. And of course, this is not at all the case when you see the struggle between competitors take place in a neutral terrain, and what they want to do is just to, you know, 
take uh, uh, there and, and then there is the place of power and the competitor want to occupy this place of power but basically you know they are not going to transform the relation of power sino simply be in power uh, uh, i mean this is of course what is or, or, uh, sometimes refer competition between elites and of course that's how much of liberal theory envisage democratic politics but in in uh, 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 that case, of course, the antagonistic dimension is eliminated. While in uh, my uh, conception of agonism, as I say, this is a struggle between hegemonic projects. They cannot be reconciled rationally. So the, this uh, uh, antagonistic dimension is always present. It is it's a real confrontation, but one which is played out under conditions which are regulated by a set of democratic procedures which are accepted by the adversaries. No? And this is why there is some kind of common symbolic uh, space. So contrary to the liberal view, according to which politics takes place in a neutral terrain, my agonistic conception of democracy acknowledges the contingent character of the hegemonic politico-economic articulation, which determine the special configuration of a society at a given moment. They are always precarious and pragmatic construction that can be disarticulated and transform as a result of the agonistic struggle among the adversaries. That is, my agonistic approach recognizing that, recognizes that society is always politically instituted and never forgets that the terrain in which hegemonic intervention takes place is always the outcome of previous hegemonic practices. It's never a neutral terrain. And this is, of course, why such approach denies the very possibility of a non-adversarial democratic politics. I mean, for instance, this is a, a very fashionable today. Uh, think of uh, Ulrich Beck or, or uh, um, Anthony Giddens, who say, no, you know, the adversarial model, that was OK for the 19th century, or maybe even part of the 20th, but no, uh, we've got moved to another kind of uh, um, modernity. They call it the second modernity. And the adversarial model has been you know, overcome. No, we can think in a politic of consensus. Well, according to my approach, you know, there is no possibility of a non-adversarial democratic politics. And I think that by ignoring this dimension of the political, all those uh, third way theorists, in fact, reduce politics to a set of supposedly technical move and neutral procedure. And I think that is very important to, to criticize uh, this uh, approach. OK, so this is for the main tenet of my conception of agonistic politics. Now that I have delineated such a conception, I am in a position to show how it differs from many other understanding of agonism. And because as I say, uh, 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 the diverse view of agonistic politics. Well, let's take, for instance, the case of Anna Arendt. Because Anna Arendt is uh, um, also presented as an agonistic theorist. Well, in my view, the main problem with the Arendtian understanding of agonism is if we were going to put it in a nutshell, I would say it's an agonism without antagonism. Well, what I mean by that is that while Arendt put great emphasis on human plurality and insists that politics deal with the community and reciprocity of human beings which are different I mean, that, uh, she definitely put a lot of emphasis on that, but she never acknowledged that this plurality is at the origin of antagonistic conflict. According to Arendt, to think politically is to develop the ability to see things from a multiplicity of perspective. As a reference to Kant, you know, in, in her book, uh, um, Kant and uh, uh, um, Lecture on Kant and Political Philosophy, uh, she brings to the fore a central the idea of a enlarged thought that one found in Kant. Uh, and I think that, in fact, uh, and she appropriated the, these ideas and said this is, this is what politics is, is about. And I think that this, in fact, testifies that her pluralism is not fundamentally different from the one of Habermas. Because, and, and the liberal one in general, because it is also inscribed in, a, in a, the horizon of an intersubjective agreement. Indeed, 
what she looks for in Kant doctrine of the ecstatic judgment, huh? because what Aaron does is to say, well, in fact, we've, we, we've got a political theory in Kant, but we've got to look at it in the third critique, you know, in this theory of aesthetic judgment. And what she looks in, uh, for in this doctrine of the aesthetic judgment is a procedure for ascertaining intersubjective agreement in the public space. So, Despite significant differences between their respective approaches, and I certainly would not want to underline them, Arendt ends up, like Habermas, envisaging the public space as aiming at consensus. To be sure, in her case, the consensus results from the exchange of voices and opinion in the, the Greek sense of doxa, not from a rational discourse like in Habermas. As Linda Zerilli, for instance, has noted, while for Habermas, consensus emerged through what Kant calls disputieren, that is an exchange of argument constrained by logical rules, for Arendt, it is a question of striten, where agreement is produced through persuasion, not through irrefutable proof. However, neither Habermas nor Arendt is able to acknowledge the hegemonic nature of every form of consensus and the ineradicability of antagonism, what we could call the moment of the Widerstreit, or uh, using a term from uh, Lyotard, le, the différent. Uh, this is the moment in, in which there is no uh, rational solution. So this is what I think there is a big difference between Arendt's uh, view and, and mine. But my conception of agonism also differs from the one which is clearly inspired from Arendt uh, that uh, one finds in uh, American political theorist Bonnie Onik, and that the view that she has put forward in her book, Political Theory and the Displacement of Politics. According to Onik, there are two perspectives on politics, which she called virtue perspective and virtue perspective. For her, at the core of the virtue perspective, and that's the one that she advocates, is the agonistic contest through which citizens are impeding to close off policies and ideas from debate and manage to keep them open to challenge. And that is, that's, that is for her, her agonistic politics. Things impede the closure of, of, of debate. Of course, I'm not disagreeing with Abonik uh, uh, on this dimension. I think it's important. But I do not think that one can envisage the nature of the agonistic struggle simply in terms of an ongoing contestation over issue and identities. One also needs to grasp the crucial role of hegemonic articulation and the necessity of not only challenging what exists, but also of constructing new articulation and new institution. I do not think that ONIC provides an adequate form of politics, because in order to envisage how to act politically, the moment of decision cannot be avoided. And this implies the establishment of frontier, the determination of a space of inclusion, exclusion. It can't just be simply, you know, open contestation. There must be a moment when we are saying, OK, well, we are contesting this form of hegemony, but we are going to construct another form of hegemony. And that's what's missing in, in uh, uh, Bonionic. And in fact, I find the same limitation in the conception put, put forward by, the, by another agonistic theorist, William Connolly, also an American political theorist. Uh, Connolly is uh, uh, influenced by Nietzsche more than Arendt. And he has tried, in fact, to make the Nietzschean conception of the agon compatible with democratic politics. Connolly called for a radicalization of democracy, thanks to the cultivation by citizens of a new democratic ethos, an ethos of engagement which drives them to engage in agonistic contestation so as to disturb all the attempt of closure. Central to the vision of Connolly is the notion of what he called agonistic respect, that he sees us emerging from the shared existential condition of the struggle for identity and a shape by the recognition of our finitude. Agonistic respect represents for Connolly the cardinal virtue of deep pluralism. And he said that is the most important political virtue in our contemporary 
pluralistic world. Well, to be sure, respect is important, and I will argue that you know, it is necessary among the adversaries involved in an agonistic struggle. But there is an important question that needs to be raised concerning the limits of agonistic respect. Can all antagonism be transformed into agonism? Can all positions be accepted as legitimate and accommodated within the agonistic struggle? Or are there demands that need to be excluded from the agonistic struggle because they cannot be part of the conflictual consensus that provides the symbolic space in which the opponent recognizes themselves as legitimate adversaries? In other words, can we envisage a pluralism without antagonism? I think those are the properly political questions, and Connolly does not allow us to address them. And this is why I do not think that his approach can provide the framework for an effective democratic politics. How can such a vision of agonistic respect challenge the dominant hegemony and transform the existing relation of power? I really do not see how that can be done you know, from that point of view. And in fact, while suggesting that he's offering us a new conception of democratic politics, I would argue that Connolly conception of agonistic respect really belongs to the realm of the ethical. It is, of course, not my intention to deny the importance of the democratic ethos, but it is not enough to envisage the hegemonic struggle. And a truly political approach requires dealing with the limit of pluralism. Here again, as in the case of Bonionic, what we do not find are the two dimensions which I have argued are central for politics. Antagonism on one side, hegemony on the other. In my view, the main shortcoming of the agonistic approaches influenced by Arendt and by Nietzsche, uh, uh, so Connolly and uh, Onik, is that because their main focus is the struggle against closure, they are not able to grasp the nature of the hegemonic struggle. Their celebration of a politic of disturbance ignores the other side of the hegemonic struggle, the establishment of a chain of equivalence among democratic struggle and the construction of an alternative hegemony. It's not enough to unsettle the democratic, the dominant procedure and to disrupt the existing arrangement in order to radicalize democracy. When we acknowledge as I have argued at the beginning, that antagonism is ineradicable and that every order is an hegemonic order, then we cannot avoid facing the core question of politics. And those questions ask, are what are the limits of agonism? What are the institutions and the form of power that are more suitable for a radical democracy? And this requires that we do not elude the moment of decision. And that will necessarily imply some form of closure. And that, of course, with what the, those approach do not want to acknowledge. You know, they're constant opening and, and they don't want any form of closure. Well, I think that this moment of you know, decision and closure, maybe an ethical discourse can avoid it, but certainly not a political discourse. And this is where you know, really lies the main difference between my view and uh, their view. This incapacity to account for the necessary moment of closure, which is constitutive of the political, is of course the necessary consequence of the associative paradigm, huh? because both Connolly and, 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 and uh, Arendt and, and uh, um, Bonnick belong to the paradigm which uh, uh, I have called associative at the beginning. And I think this is where the main differences lie, uh, um, because this paradigm envisage pluralism as the mere valorization of multiplicity. And for that reason, it tends to elude the constitutive role of conflict and antagonism. The dissociative paradigm, on the contrary, the one that I'm advocating, acknowledges the necessary constitutive character of social division and the impossibility of a final reconciliation. 
there is something in common between both views, and of course this is what you know, distinguish the agonistic view from the, the more liberal one, is that they, uh, uh, or from the pre-modern one uh, obviously too, uh, both views assert that under modern democratic condition, uh, the people cannot be envisaged as one. That's, of course, also an idea that one can find in, 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 in Claude uh, Lefort. For, for Lefort, that's really the consequence of the, the, what he called the democratic uh, revolution. So the people cannot, there is not one people. But while in the case of the uh, first approach, the associative paradigm, the people is seen as multiple, in the second one, the dissociative view, the people appear as divided. It's a big difference between celebrating multiplicity and saying, well, no, there, what we need to acknowledge is division and conflict. And my claim is that it's only when division and antagonism are recognized as being ineradicable that it is possible to think the political in a proper way. However, I'm absolutely aware that the current zeitgeist is not favorable to the dissociative approach. And in fact, there is to be a very strong tendency to envisage the political in ethical terms. This is a much more popular view. Uh, and I want, I'm going here to finish by uh, uh, show, giving you uh, uh, two other examples of that, which are not properly you know, agonistic theories, but they are theories which are also very influential today. And I think it's important to locate them in the discussion that I have uh, um, presented uh, here. Uh, I think, for instance, um, we can uh, find, find this predominance of the ethical in uh, the work of Jean-Luc Nancy. Well, according to Nancy, the plurality of being is the foundation of being. So, strong in, insistence on plurality. A single being is a, is a contradiction in, in turn. Such a being will be its own foundation, origin and intimacy. He will be incapable of being in every sense that this expression can really have. Nancy put great emphasis on what he called the between beings and the being together or being with. This means that one cannot speak of being anymore in the third person, but as he said, and here I quote him, being could not speak of itself except in this unique manner, we are. The truth of the ego sum is the nos sumus. That's the uh, end of quote. Well, the problem arises, of course, when we pass from a purely philosophical level to a political level. Indeed, in that case, we are faced with thinking about the constitution of a particular we. We can't just speak about we, we, par what particular we. And this implies a moment of exclusion. It implied the determination of a day. And this, of course, is what Nancy is not able to address. By asserting, like Arendt, the primacy of plurality, he tends to envisage the world in a too peaceful way and to miss the dimension of antagonism. And so, in fact, it's the same uh, 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 tendency. It's not, uh, it's not considered as an agonistic theory, but there are many uh, points in common between the view of Nancy and, and the associative paradigm. And I think that is also a, a, a word in this context to mention the work of Alain Badiou. Badiou also distinguishes between the political and politics. But in this case, in this case uh, that's where I was saying at the beginning, sometimes there is confusion because you know, the term referred to different things. But for, for, for Badiou, Le politique, uh, the political, refer to traditional political philosophy. This is what he criticized. And it is la politique, uh, uh, politics, which he used to specify his uh, theoretical enterprise. Well, Anna Aron is bad you main target because she argued that truth is not a category of the political sphere. And but you claims that a political philosophy which advocates the plurality of opinion by excluding the notion of truth is devoted in the last instance, he say, to the promotion of the particular politics of parliamentarism, and which he really uh, uh, want to he, 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 he really detest this kind of politics. Again, the characterization of the political 
plurality of opinion, but you assert the singularity of politics induced by subjects who are defined by their singular relation to a truth even, and not by the mutual exchange of opinion. For by you, the pluralism in which Western democracy prides itself only covers up the regime of the one. In his view, politics proper concern the event. And in order to allow for the event to occur, one is to leave aside all the facts and to be faithful to something which is not a given act of reality, but an evanescent interruption of the real. The possibility, here I'm going to quote by you, the possibility of the impossible is the grant of politics. It is massively opposed to everything we are taught today, including politics being the management of the necessary. Politics start with the same gesture by which Rousseau cleared the ground of inequality, leaving aside all the facts. It is important for an event to arrive to leave aside all the facts. End of quote. For by you, an event cannot be predicted. It is always the disruption of the state of the situation. And in said that politics is of the order of truth and the even. According to Badiou, a truth is produced by the decision of a subject to remain faithful to an event. And here I quote him again, I shall call truth, he says, the real process of fidelity to an event. That which this event produced, that which this event produced in the situation. And for him, continue, uh, keep going, is the formula of the fidelity. And his motto is, continue is being faithful to the event. Well, here I think that, and uh, it's, it's a uh, um, comment which has been made, and I, and I agree with it, by uh, Oliver Marcard, who have argued that by constructing the political side of his theory around the notion of fidelity, a Cedars in his book, for instance, uh, particularly Ethics and Simple, but you privileges an ethical perspective on politics. And I think that uh, uh, one can then rightly ask if Badiou's politic of the unconditional can reasonably be called a politic, or if one should not rather speak about an ethics. A rigorous and unconditional ethics of the unconditional is, in my view, at odds with the field of politics, which always deals with the conditional. In bad view, political action becomes an ethical, and I would argue even a quasi-religious effort at remaining faithful to a specific event through one's thinking and acting. And honestly, I do not see how we are going to enact a politic of truth in the terrain of real politics. And I must say that, you know, I, I think Badiou is an important philosopher, but when he speaks about concrete politics, it's just really completely crazy. Uh, um, does not such an injunction, you know, lead to a form of what uh, uh, Weber called a Gesinnung ethic, which is incompatible not only with the type of liberal democratic uh, pluralism that Badiou rejects, but I will argue it's also incompatible with any project of radical democracy. The domain of politics is not and cannot be the domain of the unconditional, because politics requires making decisions in an undecidable terrain. The type of order which is established through a given hegemonic configuration of power is always political order, and it should never be justified as being dictated by morality or by rationality and as being presented as the only legitimate one. As I have argued earlier, against certain form of agonism, to institute an order, frontiers need to be drawn. That is, the moment of closure is unavoidable. But this frontier is, of course, always the result of a political decision. It is constituted on the basis of a particular we day. And for that very reason, it should be recognized as something contingent, and it should always be open to contestation. According to the agonistic approach that I am advocating, what characterizes democratic politics 
is a confrontation between conflicting hegemonic projects, a confrontation with no possibility of a final reconciliation. To envisage such a confrontation in political, not in ethical terms, requires asking a series of strategic questions about the type of we that a given politics aim at creating and the chain of equivalence that is called for the establishment of that we. And this cannot take place without defining an adversary, a day that is going to serve as the constitutive outside for the we. This is, I think, what can be called the moment of the political, the recognition of the constitutive character of social division and the ineradicability of antagonism. Well, no, this is precisely the move that all the theories that I have discussed in this paper are either unwilling or, or uh, unable to make. And this is why I think their approach cannot provide an effective guide for radical politics. So, you know, to come back to the, the title of my book, I think that democratic politics need to envisage the agonistic struggle on the basis of, you know, uh, a struggle between hegemonic projects, uh, uh, between uh, uh, recognize the, 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 the ineradicability of antagonism. It cannot simply be, you know, th this uh, uh, recognition of multiplicity or uh, the, the struggle to, to, to keep constantly uh, open the, the, the discussion because this uh, uh, is not something which really can accommodate the central question of politics. So my claim is that, you know, uh, it's very important if you want to really think about uh, uh, effective democratic politics to clarify the notion of agonism that uh, you are going to use uh, and understand that there are many differences among agonistic theories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantal. I'd like to also welcome to the stage um, Gerard Raunick. We're really happy that he's agreed to open out this conversation today with Chantal. Gerald is a writer and philosopher based in Vienna. The English translation of his book Art and Revolution, which follows a similar, similar chronology to forms of resistance, was recently published by Semotext. Thank you Thanks. both. Uh, well, uh, let me take the opportunity. Uh, first, thank you, Chantal, for this to the, to the force uh, through your, your own thinking, but also to the thinking of some of your adversaries, I would say. Uh, it's not enemies. Um, but I would have liked to to have uh, but you here. Or <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, uh, well, well let my me argument is, is not so much, you know, it's basically uh, uh, concerning the agonistic theories. I just, uh, at the end, uh, so to the, the main argument is not between Badiou and me. I mean, simply mm. uh, at the end, I refer to Badiou and Nancy because I think that they are clearly uh, uh, an example of this tendency to, to in think politics through the ethical. You know, so, yeah. but, but, but that's not the main argument of, of my paper. The main argument of my paper is against, is, is concerned, you know, how one should understand agonistic politics. Yes. Um, so I, uh, I start with, uh, with two questions be before handing over to the, to the audience also. Uh, the first one is a very um, kind of, starts theoretical, but it's, uh, it has a pr pragmatical, politi politically in the sense of uh, politics, in your sense of politics, uh, um, part. Um, it's about the term of identity. You know, you, you started from Derrida at a certain point, uh, and I think Derrida um, had a reason for refraining from using the, the word identity. And he used, as you said, the term ob objectivity. Um, of course, also other uh, other theoreticians uh, um, would have refrained from that. Uh, uh, Deleuze would, for instance, uh, put it maybe that way that the different is in uh, in exchange with the different. Uh, so there is no need to to talk about different identities, but about uh, 
uh, an exchange of the different and the different, and maybe concatenations uh, of the different, uh, which might be similar to, to the idea of a chain of equi uh, equivalence. You know, uh, even in the terms, there is uh, of the chain and concatenations, there are sim similarities. Um, uh, now, coming to the um, uh, pragmatical point, you know, when uh, when you're using the term uh, identity, you, you, you're very much uh, in this uh, polite talk uh, of, on the one hand, uh, national identities, uh, and of, of course there's a big difference between your theories and uh, the, the discussions of uh, certain European politicians. But uh, that of, of course also refers to the becoming Dutch uh, question. Is, uh, are we talking about identities? Are, are we talking about collective identities? Even, and even though there these uh, con concepts of uh, identities are flexible and, and not fixed identities, uh, it's still, uh, there are overlaps with these uh, uh, pragmatic discourses, not only on a national level, but also on the European level, you know, also about this uh, uh, kind of conservative talks about uh, European identity uh, as an identity which is connected to Christianity and whatever, the Abendland uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, my, my question is, uh, maybe my first question is maybe uh, uh, to ask you to elaborate a bit why it, is it necessary to stick to the term of uh, identity? Well, I, I really think that there is a big misunderstanding here in your question because I, I also insist, I mean, one of the main tenets of my approach is, is anti-essentially. So there are no That's identity. Clear. There are yeah. no identities. I mean, uh, one uses the term identity, but always recognizing, and I think I made it clear that identity is always the result of a process of identification. And I think that, I mean, from that point of view, I, I'm bas basically uh, 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 taking my argument from, from Freud and from psychoanalysis. You know, there are no identities. Uh, uh, but what, what we call identity, because I think we cannot avoid the term, and by the way, Derrida does not avoid the term at all. Uh, he, he, he uses the term identity in, in some of his work. What I, I was saying with respect to Derrida is that is, is re, the reflection to which uh, Saturn referred to concerning the consultative outside is done at a very abstract level, in which concern basically all form of objectivity. So not simply identities, but of course it includes, it is valid for identities, but it is even more than that. It is every form of objectivity. It, 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 it's an ontological thesis about the nature of being. You know, there is no being which is not uh, constructed through uh, 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 some, no form of being which is not constructed through a constitutive outside. So, uh, uh, and once you stand from that very abstract level, then of course you can go to a specific, you know, a form of, of being, then, then you move to the level of the ontic, you know, and then of course when you speak of the level of the ontic, you are speaking of identities and, you, and, and but personal identities, but also, and, 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 and Derrida, you know, d does not uh, 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 avoid using the term of, of identity, but, and what I'm, uh, as I say, what my interest is to uh, show the consequences of this thesis, uh, um, about the fact that identities are always relational, that they are always constructed in difference to the field of the political. And the fact that in the field of the political, since we are always concerned with, you know, uh, uh, let, let's call them form of identification, if you, you know, don't want to use the term identity, but mm. it's simply, you know, uh, more, more complicated to always say form of identification. No, but, but it's, it's clearer. That, it's true that when I speak of, but I, I think it's so evident, you know, that mm. when I speak of identity, I, I never speak of essential identity, but always about form of identification. So collective form of identification, in order to have a collective form of identification, you need to have uh, uh, it opposed to, uh, uh, which I call a, a we, it needs to be uh, distinguished from a them. So that, that, that is my thesis. So, uh, uh, um, I'm not, uh, um, and then, I mean, uh, I, I don't really, once you have accepted uh, uh, um, that uh, identities are always the result of processes of, of identification, that they are never, you know, essentialist identities, well, what's at stake is, uh, 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 um, 
I don't think one should get hit at all of the notion of identity uh, uh, because it's, it's absolutely important, important in politics, important in, in all level. And there is, the, what is at stake is how you uh, envisage that. Take European identity, for instance. Of course, if you start from an essentialist perspective, you are going to say, oh, it's, it's, it's defined by, you know, it it's already exists, it's something that, that is, is an, an essentialist nature. Uh, and of course, if, if, if this is a thesis, you know, which have very important political consequences, then of course the borders are already, uh, uh, and, and there is something which cannot really, uh, uh, people can't assimilate into it or, or can, because it, it, it's given in a such a nature. But uh, once you accept that uh, identities are always a process of construction through, through discourses, I don't see why uh, one could not envisage you know, an, 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 an European identity which will be very progressive. Uh, I don't see why one should give a, a, abandon the idea of national identities. You know, it's a, of course I know that, but, but this, uh, 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 people like uh, 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 Arden Negri and, and will agree that any form of, of belonging, you know, is necessarily fascistic and reactionary and that one could need to abandon that. I mean, we might have the discussion uh, on, on that level because Definitely, this is something which I'm absolutely uh, 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 against. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous thesis because, in fact, it is uh, uh, leaving all. I think there is a very strong libidinal investment, which is, uh, uh, you know, at stake in a, a collective form of identification. And uh, if you simply, you know, want to wish this away and say, no, 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 we are all in the process of becoming the new identity, then of course what we are leaving is this terrain for the for the. Uh, uh, right-wing populists to, 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 to use, you know. And I, I, I definitely uh, am very, very strongly against this idea that we should not speak about any form of, of identity because this is, you know, fascistic and reactionary. I think what is at stake is the way you uh, envisage the construction of, of identities. Uh, and uh, what, as I say, my point, basic point is we, they, distinction cannot be eliminated. But they can be constructed in very different ways. They are, of course, very, very reactionary form of constructing the we day. But they are also form of we day, which are, uh, um, in fact, very progressive. For, and, and if I have, uh, uh, in my work, insisted on the importance of reintroducing the notion of left and right, it's because I think that left and right is, in fact, a way to construct the we them, the we day, uh, if you want to call it, in a way which is a, a conducive for, for democracy, because it, it m m really allows you to envisage the way in which, for instance, one can organize you know, around an uh, uh, issue against uh, neoliberal uh, globalization. Uh, 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 we, we, I, I don't en see how one can envisage democratic politics without uh, uh, defining an adversary, a day. You know? and, and what's important is, how you, 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 you construct you, 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 the day. And, and there are construction of the day, which are, of course, you know, if, if you are going to construct the days of the immigrant or the Muslim, of course, it's, it's absolutely you know, negative for democratic politics. But if you construct the day in terms of uh, uh, um, in transnational corporation or of, uh, you know, form of power, I think it's something very, very, very positive. So uh, I, I, I don't see the, 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 the total, the, 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 the point in, in uh, um, abandoning you know, any, any, any form of uh, uh, identity, uh, the whole question is how you envisage their construction. Um, uh, at the last point, we really agree. Um, I mean, the question how to, um, that is necessary to, the, to, to decide between left and right. And, uh, but I want to, to, to come to the core uh, of your talk and the, the, the core term, um, agonistic, um, and com uh, combine the, the logos with your bios, because uh, uh, it's maybe interesting that uh, uh, we talked yesterday evening about uh, um, your uh, considering yourself as, uh, and I would do that the same, um, you're uh, considering yourself as intellectual activist, I think it was. Uh, uh, and I think that's also uh, a part of your bios, uh, which is 
combined uh, or related to, to what you were writing, that you were involved uh, already as a very young uh, woman in 68 and, and then especially in the new social movements. And I think also uh, I read it, uh, at least uh, hegemony and socialist strategies in a way also a kind of uh, theoretical follow-up of the new social movement and a reflection, a theoretical abstract uh, reflection. And then also when we got to know uh, um, it was mainly the, the fight against uh, right-wing populist uh, movements, uh, in my case in, in Austria and, uh, and your Qaeda. Uh, and I'm uh, wondering if you could um, tell us a bit about uh, specific um, situations where you think that the uh, antagonists uh, uh, turned into agonistic uh, situations. Uh, are there uh, specific examples in these social movements uh, you, you've been involved or you, you inter intervened in uh, that you could uh, describe as, as examples? Um, well, uh, they, they are examples of... Uh, uh, I, I don't think that it's... it's, it's uh, um, really appropriate to make this um, well the, 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 the many of the of the social um, movement let, let me think in 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 western europe at least but also in in, in the u.s were for me for for attempts form of agonistic politics they they, they were certainly not transformation of, of Agoni at, uh, antagonism in, in, into agonism. Mm. There are uh, uh, cases of transformation of antagonism into agonism, but at a very different context. For instance, what has happened in, in Northern Ireland, I think, is definitely uh, 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 a case of transformation. You, you have an agonism. You've got we, they group, you know, which are constructed as enemies. Uh, and the attempt, of course, has been to transform the, the, the relation between them and no, and, and so far, let's hope, you know, it, it, it's going to, it took a long time, but it seemed that the, no, they've managed to transform this relation to create a symbolic terrain in, uh, um, among, you know, uh, Protestant and, and, and uh, Catholics, and in which they are not seeing each other as uh, enemies anymore, but uh, uh, as uh, adversaries. I think if, if I was going to give, you know, an example of really, uh, uh, um, Agonistic politics, uh, transformation of agonism into uh, antagonism, antagonism I, I, I would say uh, that's the one. Another case, which of course is far from being resolved, but where what is at stake is transformation of antagonism into agonism, is in the case of Israel Palestine. You know, you've got there a situation in which you've got uh, uh, enemies, and, and of course we know that. Uh, I think that's a good example because it shows that there is, it's not a Thing that you are going to find a rational solution. There is there two people, co you know, fighting for the same uh, 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 land, and there is no rational uh, solution. But there are, of course, ways in which uh, uh, some kind of precarious solution could could be found, in which at least they are not uh, 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 in a relation of enmity of antagonism, but in relation of, of agonism. But as I say, we are not, you know near to the solution, but this is clearly what I will call a transformation of uh, antagonism uh, into agonism. But uh, in fact, my, 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 my argument about agonistic politics is that what, what democratic politics should do is precisely impede the, the, those forms of agonism, to, uh, of antagonism to take place, because once you have an antagonistic uh, situation, it's very difficult, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to transform it into an agonistic one. Uh, and I think that in order to um, impede, uh, uh, um, the, let's say, the question at stake is to acknowledge conflict. Of course, because if, if you say, no, no, you know, consensus at the center, like, but the, the main uh, 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 task of democratic politics is to uh, uh, find ways in which uh, interests can be, you know, aggregated and negotiated, that is the associative model, or in which we can find uh, ways uh, through deliberation through, to uh, arrive to, you know, the, the, the impartial uh, 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 decision. And, and what I'm really concerned, you see, is, and, and in fact, it, it, it relates to what the point what you are making, because my theoretical work, I'm a political theorist, but I'm really interested about, you know, 
and, and my, my reflection is driven by politics, by, by what I see uh, uh, happening around me. It's not you know, theoretical reflection on, on its own. It's always on the basis of uh, specific cases. For instance, as you were saying, I've been very interested in, in uh, uh, right-wing popular development because that, that's the kind of thing that you know, uh, suscitated my, my theoretical uh, reflection. And what I have been uh, particularly concerned is to see that political, uh, I think that liberal political theory uh, <coughs> Uh, is really playing a very negative uh, role uh, in democratic politics. Not that I give too much influence, you know, to philosophers, uh, but I think that they, they, there can be, a, 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 they can play a, a negative role, which is, uh, you know, dangerous enough. When they tell you that basically what uh, uh, we need are impartial procedure, that conflict, you know, is, is being overcome, uh, and and then of course it puts a democratic theory on the wrong track. Instead of of recognizing that they are conflict, there will always be conflict, and that what democratic, you know. Uh, institution needs to, to, and that democratic institution need to be established in which this conflict is acknowledged, but is given the possibility to uh, uh, take place according to uh, agonistic channel. I, th I think this is really very important, not, not uh, uh, to negate uh, um, conflict, to say that's uh, like Beck and Giddens, no, no we are uh, you know, in, in a new uh, type of uh, uh, society in which the uh, consensus of the center can be established. All those things are, in fact, very dangerous because uh, it, this is, in, in, in what's one of my thesis, it has created the terrain which has le uh, le led to uh, uh, right-wing populist movement you know, to really create a form of we day which is, is not conducive to, 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 to democratic politics, you see. While uh, uh, if we don't really have within the democratic traditional system possibility to really offer alternative, to l give people a choice between you know, different uh, uh, models uh, of society, when we tell them there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization, when the left and the right, you know, if, in fact, the left does not even want to call it itself left, it's no, it's center left. Uh, um, so when, basically, I, 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 I remember, you know, sometimes making a, a, a joke with my, my student, at, at the, uh, in, 19, in 2002, you will remember the election in France where uh, uh, Le Pen came second, you know, for, for the presidential election, uh, uh, and uh, Jospin, a socialist, was eliminated. During the campaign, I had said to my student, basically, you know, the choice which is offered between Chirac and Jospin is like between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, because there is what, and Jospin had begun by saying, I'm not a socialist, you know, I'm a, so I would say, oh, how do you expect that people are going to really, uh, you know, go and vote and uh, when, so of course, this is exactly what happened. People didn't uh, 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 want to vote for Jospin and, 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 and Le Pen came, you know, second. I was shocked like everybody else, but I was not surprised because I had exactly said this is what's going to happen. So it's very important that there is, and that's what I call an agonistic struggle, that there are uh, 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 alternatives which are offered. Uh, people can identify. They are, they are, there is not this idea, well, we can't do anything because of globalization. Um, so this, this is, uh, uh, for me, very important to allow for those agonistic channels within the democratic system, you know, uh, because if that does not uh, happen, then conflict uh, is going to take form which are not conducive to democracy. And I think that, um, well, this is why, and, and, and I know we've got some disagreement about that, uh, we've been having it for a long time. I, uh, um, I've always argued that uh, it's very important to have a synergy between uh, 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 um, social movement and you know, uh, uh, political parties. Uh, and I know it's you know, not easy because political parties are you know, generally a catastrophe, so we don't really want to vote for them. Uh, uh, um, and social movement also uh, are afraid very rightly so to be recuperated. But on the other side, you know, if, if social movement on their own are never going to be enough, this is my thesis, in order to, to, to challenge an, an, an existing hegemony. We need to have this synergy between social movement 
and uh, uh, trade unions and parties in order to construct you know, a chain of equivalence which is going to challenge the exist, uh, existing hegemony. And I think this is why you know, the, the agonistic struggle at envisaging should be a, st a struggle taking place you know, within, uh, uh, with collaboration of the, 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 the social movement and all the different forms of, of institution. But you know, again, that's a, a, a thesis which is, is unfortunately you know, not, not shared by all people who uh, um, want to <laughs> challenge neoliberalism. Yes. Um, uh, comments, uh, questions, remarks from the audience, please. Um, sorry. Oh. Um, good afternoon. Um, by stressing uh, the antagonistic uh, character of society, fundamental conflict, uh, I wonder if you are aware that you are thinking about the theory of civil war, uh, a theory that is uh, missing in political thinking. It's uh, said by Agamben, Giorgio Agamben. So my question is, are you aware you are, you are busy with the theory of civil war? No, I don't agree with that at all, because uh, 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 precisely, um, and by the way, you refer to Agamben, but both of us are uh, 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 referring to Carl Schmitt. You, if you, you had say Carl Schmitt, you know, because Agamben takes most of his idea from Schmitt and, and Agamben. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but, uh, yeah, uh, no, but, I, 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 uh, but, but it's, it's a very relevant question, because I think precisely what my aim is to impede to, 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 to civil war, to recognize that, uh, uh, um, because what is civil war? Civil war is precisely when you have an antagonistic conflict. Um, when, when you have an, a conflict between a friend and enemies, yeah, that, that uh, 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 will lead to civil war. And this is, by the way, the reason why I think that uh, uh, Schmidt uh, considered that liberal democracy, pluralist democracy was an unviable regime because he believed that if you allow uh, uh, pluralism inside a, a political uh, association, this pluralism is really necessarily going to be expressed in terms of uh, friend and enemy, and of course this is civil war, so this is uh, not uh, 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 acceptable. And in fact, I, uh, uh, m most of my uh, reflection about agonism in fact come from some kind of uh, um, adversarial relation with, with, with Schmidt, because I think that Schmidt is right uh, uh, to stress the, 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 well, the what he called for him. He turned in recognizing this antagonistic dimension. Uh, but where he, uh, 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 so I, 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 but I don't follow, say, work has been precisely to try to, 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 to show that there is a solution which Schmidt did not uh, envisage uh, uh, or didn't want to, to envisage because of course he was you know, not particularly wanting to, to have a, a radicalization of democracy. Um, but, uh, and it is to, to, to say that this antagonistic dimension uh, can be played out in different ways. Okay. Let's say antagonism is in fact a, a conflict in which there is no rational solution, and this is because conflict. Everybody accepts conflict, you know, the, 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 the liberals. But for them, conflict is always, you know, way solution can be negotiated. I think, and the, what uh, um, liberal do not want to acknowledge is precisely the, the the fact that they are antagonistic conflict. And I think Schmidt is right to insist, but this political dimension has got to do with antagonistic conflict. But uh, uh, my distinction between agonism and antagonism is precisely an attempt to show that you can perfectly acknowledge this dimension and not be led to a, 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 a civil war. Because this antagonistic dimension can be played out in two different ways. Then can be what we would call, let's say, antagonism proper, huh? and that will be the, the friend and enemy relation, uh, uh, the Schmittian one, but you can also envisage, and this is my agonism, a way in which this uh, 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 conflict, which is no rational solution, so it's still antagonistic, but it played uh, out in a form which 
is not antagonistic uh, in terms of friend and enemy, but it is between adversaries. And the basic difference that I'm uh, interested in this paper is that the, there is among the adversaries a conflictual consensus. They do agree on the, it, what I call the ethical political principle, which are uh, you know, going to need to inform the association. Uh, but they disagree about their interpretation, and this is a disagreement which does not have a rational solution. So, but, but still, there is something in common. So they, 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 they is, it's not civil war. It, this is what I call the hegemonic struggle. And for me, this is what democratic politics should be about. You know, not, not think, envisaging people with different interests which are going to be negotiated. Acknowledge the, the fact that they are uh, antagonism, but find the institution which will allow this conflict to take uh, to be played out in, in, in a way which do not destroy the, the, the uh, political association, which does not lead to civil war. So this is my answer to Schmidt. So, and, and of course, in that case, uh, uh, um, you can have pluralism, you can have uh, um, recognition of conflict, but and, and this nevertheless, you know, can be played out in in. Uh, uh, the democratic association it does not necessarily lead to, to, to civil war. There was, okay, there was a second question there and then two here. You give the example of Northern Ireland and um, the Palestine-Israeli conflict as a, maybe a move from the, the antagonistic to the agonistic. Um, Am I too pessimistic when I see uh, that in my country and also yours, Belgium, there might be the, the opposite <laughs> my country, going on? By the way, you know, uh, I'm Belgian too. Uh, the, from a uh, maybe agonistic space to a more antagonistic uh, relationship between the two communities at this moment, and linked to that, uh, a notion that this very important Belgian politic compromise. You talked about conflict consensus, but there is something like compromise where two sides or three sides give in something of their demands uh, in order to establish uh, a new uh, common space. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, compromise is, 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 is a, a, a part and parcel of, of politics and they are moments, but we must recognize that those compromises are always precarious, they are always determined by a certain form of hegemony and, and we need to recognize them as they are as what they are, compromise, you know. Uh, uh, uh. But so, so I, 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 I definitely, there is definitely a, pl a place uh, for, 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 for compromise. Uh, uh, what, what I was, what I put, because in fact, I would say when the acceptance of compromise is precisely recognizing that there is no rational solution, you know, so, but, but we, the best thing we can do is a compromise, yes, that definitely, that's perfectly compatible with agonistic uh, politics because it can take place the moment of compromise within agonistic politics. The case of Belgium, I don't really know. I, I, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say that at the moment the, the relation is antagonistic, thanks God. Uh, 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 but one should not uh, eliminate the possibility that it could become antagonistic. It could. I, 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 honestly, I remember because, uh, the, the, of course, the, 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 the one of the best, I mean, best uh, works, uh, uh, if you want to put it, example of uh, 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 the way in which suddenly uh, uh, ag agony, uh, um, well, there was no agony, but there was a problem, but antagonism emerged is the case of the, the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And because in Yugoslavia, we had for many, many years, uh, we, they, which were uh, coexisting, uh, uh, um, in an was not in an uh, antagonistic uh, uh, condition. You had the, the Serb and the Croat and the Bosnian and the, and the Slovenes, and they were, uh, in fact, I think that, you know, the, in part, it was thanks to Tito who had created those kind of so complicated uh, uh, um, institution which made this coexistence possible. Death of Tito, Milosevic came to power, and of course, he destroyed, you know, all those very precarious uh, uh, in institution. And, that this is where you know antagonism emerged because it's exactly the the, 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 the situation in which the, the, the and I, and in many cases I think it was really phantasmatic it was not a real danger but they 
communities which had been living next to each other suddenly began to see the, o the other as you know, an enemy, the, as, as putting into question their uh, uh, way of life, and, and this is where antagonism emerged. I remember that uh, uh, at that time, when it was, I was thinking, oh my God, could something like that ever happen in Belgium? <coughs> you know, and, and, uh, and because honestly, who would have thought that, that uh, uh, in a country like Yugoslavia, this could happen? You know, uh, uh, it was really unthinkable. Because normally it would happen you know, very far away, yeah, but, but no, in Yugoslavia. And I remember wonder, wondering very precisely about that. Could that ever happen in Belgium? I think we can't, unfortunately, you know, take it for granted that it will never happen. It can happen. And this is why I think it's so important to, 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 to find ways in which the, 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 the conflict is going to, 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 to have the, 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 the channels which, which allow it to, to, to go on in on, on an, an agonistic way so that it does not become antagonistic. And of course, you know, some, some kind of compromise need, need to be done on both sides. Um, thanks, Chantal. I'll try and make it quick because there's lots of things I'd like to mention. So I'll try and focus on one which maybe encapsulates some others. It's, it's really, do, do, you, do you, you, you still, still seem to feel that the realm of pragmatic politics that we have now, the party political democratic system that we have now in Western Europe, um, is, is, is still a, a form where the political or hegemonic conflicts can be discussed. And, and, and for me, I suppose that that's a question rather than a given, that the, the, poli the, the democratic politics that we have actually can function in the way which I absolutely uh, um, underwrite that you, you discussed. And there was one moment in your talk which I thought indicated maybe a certain open, uh, openness to some other ways of thinking. And that was when you talked about the US, the uh, some of the, the American theorists, particularly Bonnie Onik and, and Colin Connolly, were critical of them because you said they ignored the need for making decisions but also they ignored the need to create new kinds of institutions. In a sense, they, their problem was that they were accepting the democratic structure as it is, as a given, uh, rather than thinking about the possibility of other kinds of democracy, not the parliamentary liberal democracy that we have, but other kinds of democracy which maintain liberty and equality for all, but nevertheless is phrased within completely different institutional structures. Mm -hmm. And so I, I suppose what I'm asking is do you see new fields, new proposals, even existing institutional fields, and obviously the art field could be one, um, where, which could provide a space for the political and hege hegemonic conflict to be, to be discussed, even to be played out, outside of politics. In other words, is it possible in, in our current Western European political context to discuss the political at all? Or does it need the politics to change before the political can re-enter? politics in your distinction? Um, well, let me try to clarify what... Um, well, first, I, 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 I don't think that uh, democratic politics is at all working well at the moment. In fact, I, will, I, I agree with Jacques Rancière when he speaks that we are in a post-democracy. You know, I, I think, yeah, we the, the definitively... Uh, uh, um, no, the, the, this is not... I, I, yeah, we, it's still, of course, you know, we are uh, 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 um, still under democracies, but but the, the whole content has been has been you know taken away, uh, 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 um, and this is precisely what what worries me, that uh, uh, many people uh, uh, and, and it has been taken away basically because of the blurring the frontier between left and right because of the idea that there is no uh, alternative and, uh, and and of course what I find uh, uh, really problematic is that many uh, people are seeing that as a progress you know they say ah oh, but no uh, uh, we uh, become democracy become more mature we can have a consensus in the center and so with uh, they, they celebrate this i mean that that's the the the, the, the you know th third way theories and um, i think i in fact see this uh, as, a, as a danger for democracy and and in fact the the, the development of right wing populist parties are precisely for me a consequence of, of this so i think at the moment uh, 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 we are getting less and less uh, the, the meaning of democracy is is uh, because basically today, uh, um, one of the, the, the points I've been making in my previous work is, is that 
our form of uh, liberal uh, uh, democracy. And by the way, I mean, I don't want to open a completely uh, different, we could spend hours on that, but I want uh, to clarify that for me, this is only one understanding of democracy among possible ones. I certainly do not agree with Habermas and Mbibel when he say that this is the most rational form of, 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 of uh, uh, politics, that it should be universalized. You know, I, I, I think that I, as, as far as uh, uh, Western Europe is concerned, I think this is really a, a form of, of understanding of democracy. So, political language game, again, to use a, a big expression, which, you know, I, 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 I feel uh, having been constructed as subject in this tradition, I identify with this tradition. But I certainly don't want to say this is, you know, what the model that should be applied in China and in, in India, so that, but that's another uh, uh, problem. So let, let's speak of, you know, our uh, form of, of, of democracy. It is the articulation between the liberal tradition of, of pluralism and the democratic tra tra tradition. Uh, but it, and of course, those two tendencies, and I think there, there Schmidt is right, there is some kind of, we call it a contradiction, I call it a tension, but, but it is, they, they pull into that different direction. But this is what the agonistic struggle should be about, you know, with which role for the liberal and which role for the democratic tradition. But today, of course, the problem is that yeah, there is such an hegemony of the liberal tradition that people understand, well, democracy, if you have got election and, and, and uh, uh, human rights, this is democracy. The, the whole democratic tradition has been completely uh, 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 almost erased, you know. It's, it's, uh, so what I think that to, today what we need to, to do uh, in order to revivify this model is to recover the, the importance of the democratic tradition. Uh, but. I think that this can be done uh, without, uh, 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 let's call it a revolution, without destroying uh, what, what exists. Because I think that, um, let's call it the, 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 the resources exist, I think, for an uh, um, immanent struggle within uh, uh, modern pluralist democracy. Because what we need is to revivify those values, to find ways in which, for instance, those institutions can, can be you know, put in movement again. And um, so, for instance, and there I definitely disagree with but you, I do, I do not want to see the end to parliamentary politics. I think that they are, uh, there is an important role to be played by, uh, by parties. Uh, in, if once you accept that people is divided, there must be ways in which those divisions are expressed. But of course, uh, they also sh will need to have uh, uh, other form of uh, the, the, um, you know, democratic participation. For instance, I think it's very important to create grassroots form of democracy, local form of democracy, not simply, it cannot just be parliamentary politics, but it's not something that will eliminate, I'm certainly not in favor of, of direct democracy uh, at all level. I think that in fact, or the absolute democracy that, that Art and Neri are talking about, you know, because that in fact implies an idea of the, the people is being uh, 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 not divided. Uh, and if only they think the people will be able to give uh, uh, the, the, the voice to their, uh, uh, um, but the, their demands uh, uh, without all you know, the, 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 those problems of, of, of representation, then we could have a more democratic uh, uh, societies. I don't believe that. I think that we need many different levels of, of representation. Uh, it to, to, so it, it is something which we need to, to revivify and transform, of course, you know, create new, new institutions. Uh, but it does not uh, mean a complete break with uh, uh, the basic institution of uh, uh, pluralism. You give the example of Northern Ireland and um, the Palestine-Israeli conflict as a, maybe a move from the, the antagonistic to the agonistic. Um, Am I too pessimistic when I see uh, that in my country and also yours, Belgium, there might be the, <laughs> the opposite country, going on? By the way, you know, uh, I'm Belgian too. Uh, the, from a uh, maybe agonistic space to a more antagonistic uh, relationship between the two communities at this moment, and linked to that, uh, a notion that this very important Belgian politic compromise. You talked about conflict consensus, but there is something like compromise where two sides or three sides give in something of their demands uh, in order to establish uh, a new uh, common space. 
Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, compromise is, 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 is a, a, a part and parcel of, of politics, and they are moment, but we must recognize that those compromises are always precarious, they are always determined by a certain form of hegemony, and, and we need to recognize them as they are as what they are, compromise, you know. Uh, uh, uh. But so, so I, 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 I definitely, there is definitely a, pl a place uh, for, 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 for compromise. Uh, uh, what, what I was, what I put, because in fact, I would say when the acceptance of compromise is precisely recognizing that there is no rational solution, you know. So, but, but we, the best thing we can do is a compromise. Yes, that, that definitely, that's perfectly compatible with agonistic uh, politics because it can take place the moment of compromise within agonistic politics. The case of Belgium, I don't really know. I, I, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say that at the moment the, the relation is antagonistic, thanks God. Uh, 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 but one should not uh, eliminate the possibility that it could become antagonistic. It could. I, 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 honestly, I remember because, uh, the, the, of course, the, 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 the one of the best, I mean, best uh, works, uh, uh, if you want to put it, <laughs> example of uh, 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 the way in which suddenly uh, 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 agony, uh, um, well, there was no agony, not the, not the problem, but antagony emerged is the case of the, the, the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And because in Yugoslavia, we had for many, many years, uh, we, they, which were uh, coexisting uh, uh, um, in an was not in an uh, antagonistic uh, uh, condition. You had the, the Serb and the Croat and the Bosnian and the, and the Slovenes, and they were, uh, in fact, I think that, you know, the, in part, it was thanks to Tito who had created those kind of so complicated uh, uh, um, institution which made this coexistence possible. Death of Tito, Milosevic came to power, and of course, he destroyed, you know, all those very precarious uh, uh, institution. And, that this where you know antagonism emerged because it's exactly the the the, 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 the situation in which the, the, the and I, and in many cases I think it was really phanta phantasmatic it was not a real danger but they communities which had been living next to each other suddenly began to see the the other as you know an enemy the, as, as putting into question their uh, uh, way of life, and, and this is where antagonism emerged. I remember that uh, at that time, when it was, I was thinking, oh my God, could something like that ever happen in Belgium? <coughs> you know, and, and, uh, and because honestly, who would have thought that, that uh, uh, in a country like Yugoslavia, this could happen? You know, uh, uh, it was really unthinkable. Because normally it would happen you know, very far away, yeah, but, but no, in Yugoslavia. And I remember wonder, wondering very precisely about that. Could that ever happen in Belgium? I think we can't, unfortunately, you know, take it for granted that it will never happen. It can happen. And this is why I think it's so important to, 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 to find ways in which the, 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 the conflict is going to, 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 to have the, 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 the channels which, which allow it to, to, to go on on, on an, an agonistic way so that it does not become antagonistic. And of course, you know, some, some kind of compromise need, need to be done on both sides. Um, thanks, Chantal. I'll try and make it quick because there's lots of things I'd like to mention. So I'll try and focus on one which maybe encapsulates some others. It's it's really, do, do, you, do you, you, you still, still seem to feel that the realm of pragmatic politics that we have now, the party political democratic system that we have now in Western Europe, um, is, is, is still a, a form where the political or hegemonic conflicts can be discussed. And, and, and for me, I suppose that that's a question rather than a given, that the, the, poli the, the democratic politics that we have actually can function in the way, which I absolutely uh, um, underwrite, that you, you discussed. And there was one moment in your talk which I thought indicated maybe a certain open, uh, openness to some other ways of thinking. And that was when you talked about the US, the uh, some of the, the American theorists, particularly Bonnie Onik and, and Colin Connolly, were critical of them because you said they ignored the need for making decisions but also they ignored the need to create new kinds of institutions. In a sense, they, their problem was that they were accepting the democratic structure as it is, as a given, uh, rather than thinking about the possibility of other kinds 
of democracy, not the parliamentary liberal democracy that we have, but other kinds of democracy which maintain liberty and equality for all, but nevertheless is phrased within completely different institutional structures. Mm -hmm. And so I, I suppose what I'm asking is, do you see new fields, new proposals, even existing institutional fields, and obviously the art field could be one, um, where which could provide a space for the political and hegemonic conflict to be to be discussed, even to be played out, outside of politics. In other words, is it possible in in our current Western European political context to discuss the political at all, or does it need the politics to change before the political can re-enter politics? In your distinction. Um. Well, let me try to clarify what... Um, well, first, I, I, I don't think that uh, democratic politics is at all working well at the moment. In fact, I, I, I agree with Jacques Rancière when he speaks that we are in a post-democracy. You know, I, I think, yeah, we the, the definitively... Uh, uh, um, no, the, the, this is not... Uh, uh, yeah, we, it's still, of course, you know, we are uh, 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 um, still under democracies but but the, the whole content has been has been you know taken away uh, 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 um, and this is precisely what what worries me that uh, uh, many people uh, uh, and, and it has been taken away basically because of the blurring the frontier between left and right because of the idea that there is no uh, alternative and uh, and and of course what I find uh, uh, really problematic is that many uh, people are seeing that as a progress you know, they say, ah, but no, uh, uh, we uh, become, democracy become more mature, we can have a consensus in the center, and so with, uh, they, they celebrate this. Uh, I mean, that, that's the, 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 the you know, th third way theories. And um, I think I, in fact, see this uh, as, a, as a danger for democracy. And, and in fact, the, the, the development of right-wing populist parties are precisely, for me, a consequence of, of this. So I think at the moment, uh, 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 we are getting less and less uh, the, the meaning of democracy is, is uh, because basically today, uh, um, one of the, the, the points I've been making in my previous work is, is that our form of uh, liberal uh, uh, democracy, and by the way, I mean, I don't want to open a completely uh, different, we could spend hours on that, but I want uh, to clarify that for me, this is only one understanding of democracy among possible ones. I certainly do not agree with Abermatt and people when they say that this is the most rational form of, 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 of uh, uh, politics, that it should be universalized. You know, I, I, I think that I, as, as far as uh, Western Europe is concerned, I think this is really a, a form of, of understanding of democracy. So, political language game, again, to use a, a Bingenshan expression, which, you know, I, 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 I feel uh, having been constructed as subject in this tradition, I identify with this tradition. But I certainly don't want to say this is, you know, what the model that should be applied in China and in, in India, so that, but that's another uh, uh, problem. So let, let's speak of, you know, our uh, uh, form of, of, of democracy. It is the articulation between the liberal tradition of, of pluralism and the democratic tra tra tradition. Uh, but it, and of course, those two tendencies, and I think there, there Schmidt is right, there is some kind of, we call it a contradiction, I call it a tension, but, but it is, they, they pull into that different direction. But this is what the agonistic struggle should be about, you know, which, which role for the liberal and which role for the democratic tradition. But today, of course, the problem is that yeah, there is such an hegemony of the liberal tradition that people understand, well, democracy, if you have got election and, and, and uh, uh, human rights, this is democracy. The, the whole democratic tradition has been completely uh, 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 almost erased, you know. It's, it's, uh, so what I think that to, today what we need to, to do uh, in order to revivify this model is to recover the, the importance of the democratic tradition. Uh, but I think that this can be done uh, without, uh, 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 let's call it a revolution, without destroying uh, what, what exists. Because I think that, um, let's call it the, 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 the resources exist, I think, for an uh, um, imminent struggle within uh, um, modern pluralist democracy. Because what we need is to revivify the, 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 those values, to find ways in which, for instance, those in 
institution can can be you know put in movement again and um, so for instance and there are this they, they definitely they agree with but you i do i do not want to see uh, the end to parliamentary politics i think that they are uh, there is an important role to be played by uh, by parties uh, in if once you accept that people is divided there must be ways in which those divisions are expressed but of course uh, there also sh will need to have uh, uh, other form of uh, uh, the, the um, you know, democratic participation. For instance, I think it's very important to create grassroots form of democracy, local form of democracy, not simply, it cannot just be parliamentary politics, but it's not something that will eliminate, I'm certainly not in favor of, of direct democracy uh, at all level. I think that in fact, or the absolute democracy that, that Art and Neri are talking about, you know, because that in fact implies an idea of the, the people is being uh, 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 not divided. Uh, and if only they think the people will be able to give uh, uh, the, the, the voice to their, uh, uh, um, but the, their demands uh, uh, without all you know, the, 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 those problems of, of, of representation, then we could have a more democratic uh, uh, societies. I don't believe that. I think that we need many different levels of, of representation. Uh, it to, to, so it, it is something which we need to, to revivify and transform, of course, you know, create new, new institutions. Uh, but it does not uh, mean a complete break with uh, uh, the basic institution of uh, uh, pluralism.